Welcome to another episode of Chopping It Up with Visionary. This is honestly an, an exclusive one. Um, many people that know me personally know exactly how much I love and enjoy MMA. And this is my first MMA interview. Here I am joined by uh, Joe Gennetti, the lightweight and welterweight champion of Cage Titans. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Doing well. Doing well. Um, we're just going to hop right into it. Um, right now, you are... Fight, you're in fight camp, right? You're about to defend your lightweight championship on September 23rd. How's everything yes, going sir. with the fight camp? It's going good, man. You know, California's treating me really good. It's sunny out. It's nice beach weather. Um, getting a great sweat in AKA, you know, the weight's coming off. My diet's great. Cardio's great. Still feel strong. So, I mean, can't ask for it any better, honestly. Um, and recently you were just with UFC welterweight uh, Gilbert Burns. Uh, what was that experience like? It was really cool, man. He's he's like exactly how you see him in all the videos. He's a funny dude. He's super humble, super cool, and super knowledgeable, obviously. Like his jujitsu is just out of this world. You know, we did a seminar and he was just showing some basic stuff and just like the little details that he added in like really clicked and made a lot of sense. Uh, what were some of the techniques or some of the things that you took away from Gilbert Burns? Um, really, it was just like mindset stuff that I didn't know that he was going to go over, but just having a certain mindset in the gym, similar to on fight night, you know, I'm what a lot of people call like a, a game time performer. Like I don't perform great in the gym, but come fight night, it's like, all right, it's all action. It's all business. Um, but, you know, he was explaining that, like trying to keep that same or replicate that same mindset in the gym will elevate you further. And almost a year ago to this date, um, you, t you had a TKO victory over Trevor Good which was his retirement fight. Um, I was a little curious about that. So was that a scheduled retirement fight or was that a spur of the moment thing? You won, he retired. How did that go? Um, I think he fought one more time since then. I don't know if he's plans on fighting after that. Um, but no, I hadn't heard anything about his retirement. You know, it was one of those things where he was a big name in the welterweight division and nobody at 55 would fight me. And so I was like, screw it. Like, I'll do it, but let's put the belt on the line. Like, it was vacant. You know, the former champ, Billy Goff, who's actually about to make his UFC debut, had vacated because he got signed. And I was like, sure, let's add another belt. You know, let's make it interesting. I want to go more into your fighting skills. So in a previous interview, you, and I quote, um, when you first started, submissions were very tough for you. So exactly what moment did submissions start to click? Um, honestly, I don't know the exact moment, but I do know it was just after being submitted so many times and kind of like, I kind of reverse engineered my jujitsu. Like I just, you know, went from getting tapped out seven times in one training session to five to four to three to two to one. And then like slowly started getting my own submissions because I had worked so hard on the defense. I was like, okay, well, I know how they're going to defend it. Cause that's what I would do. And then I just got to beat that career you have yet to be finished your only four defeats have come from decisions split decision unanimous decision uh, what do you credit the um the fact that you haven't been finished to um you know everybody that's helped me along the way you know my skill set and you know my mentality and the support group I have around me and I think just like you know the unfortunate things that have happened in my life have kind of just given me you know, that heart, you know, even as an amateur, I've never been finished. Uh, I was undefeated as an amateur and I had some hard fights as an amateur, but you know, I've been through harder stuff outside of the cage and I made it through that. So I know I can make it through anything in the cage. Your striking has improved a lot from your early cage Titan cage Titan days to uh, the ultimate fighter to even now. So um, kind of similar to the previous question, what do you credit to your improvement in your striking realm? Um, honestly, I think it was more mental than it was technical or physical. Um, it was just one of those things of like having the right support system around me, the right people that like, you know, where I would lack confidence, they would see my skills and remind me that I have something to be confident about and to just let my hands go when I fight. Um, because, you know, I've been telling people for years, like I can outstrike any of these guys and you'd watch my fights and be like, nah, but it was there, you know, I really haven't added a crazy amount to my striking. There has been some, um, and I think that it's made big improvements, but it's a lot of little things. But um, the giant improvements that people are seeing, I think are more mental, like the right switch just got flipped. And uh, I'm just kind of confident everywhere nowadays, especially being out here at AKA, working striking with the best guys in the world, you know, working grappling and wrestling with the best guys in the world. I know if I'm at least hanging in with them, 
whoever I fight would not hang in with them. So I know I'm doing better. Exactly why I brought up the Trevor Good fight, because that was one of the uh, few times where I've seen you throw spinning strikes. You know, you hit him with a <laughs> spinning back fist. You know, I thought that was pretty awesome to see from you, somebody that, like you said, wasn't really known for their striking. So, um, again, I'm happy to see the improvements. Um, ideally, how often do you plan on fighting per year now that you're a double champion? Uh, honestly, if if a perfect world, like I had enough money to come out and do fight camps whenever I'd want, I'd say about three to six times a year. Um, you know, my fiance wouldn't be too happy about it because I would mean coming out to California and leaving her at home for a little bit. But, you know, I'm hoping one day I can bring her out here with me to do these camps. But these last few years, I honestly haven't been super active like I wanted to be because, you know, either, you know, my last fight that fell through, I came, I became sick during the weight cut and ended up in the ER. But, you know, opponents pulling out or opponents saying yes. And then when the contract gets sent out, they say no. And when I book a fight, it's very much like a time sensitive thing because it's so expensive for me to do these fight camps. I've got to get time off of work. I got to save money up. I got to get sponsors to help with the rest of um, my fight camp expenses. So, you know, when a guy calls and he's like, hey, I'll fight him in two or three weeks. It's like I haven't even done a fight camp. I haven't had the money to, you know, and a lot of people say, like, you know, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. But, you know, California is just not in my price range. You know, it's not a place where I, I can move my family out to. So it's like a temporary thing I do for fight camp. And I can't afford to just wake up one day and go to California and go train for however long. You kind of went into um, what you were speaking to Dana White about in terms of growth. Um, and I quote, um, you were saying that maybe Dana White saw something in you that you needed to grow mature and grow uh, what exactly do you believe were those things that needed to mature and grow and do you still need to mature and grow in those areas in order to make it to the UFC um I think the biggest thing for me from back then to now was I think I just needed to take the sport a little bit more serious I've always trained as hard as physically possible but I always had fun with it too and not to say I don't enjoy it or don't have fun with it now but I do take it much more serious, which you can see, you know, in my face-offs and my fights and my walkouts, because as fun as it is, it's more fun for me in hindsight. You know, I can look back on my fights and go, wow, that was really cool. Or, look how I did that. Or look how I won or however the fight went. Um, but if I lose, it's such a negative toll on my life to just play with that. Like it's a game. I think, you know, you can kind of see that in the ultimate fighter finale that I lost, you know, I didn't perform well. And, you know, I wasn't feeling great that night and I really didn't rally hard enough to, you know, fight as if I was fighting for a contract. You know, we just saw somebody fight on the Ultimate Fighter finale and he lost and Dana's already guaranteed him a contract. He went out and put everything on the line. He took it serious, you know, and he showed that he belongs to be in the UFC. I didn't when I was on the finale. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. And, you know, I think I'm there personally, but, you know, if there's something else, then I'll just, you know, I'm going to keep improving. I'm going to be the best version of me. It's it's funny to hear because five years ago, looking at your old interviews, you've always had this calm demeanor, but currently that calm demeanor has more of, um, it sounds like you have more hunger within you. It sounds like, you know, like you said, you're taking things more seriously. And I believe we're going to see you in the UFC very soon. I, I hope to see you in the UFC very soon. I, you're a very talented individual. And, you know, like I said, you're making a, you're making adjustments that fighters need to make. So. It's good I appreciate to see that. that. Thank you. Always. I kind of want to dig back into um, not your personal life, but, you know, high school days. Um, yep. You mentioned not making the basketball team. So you went ahead. You fought. Uh, you did wrestling at heavyweight. You were a little chubby. You explained your yeah. little on the heavy side. And then you began your MMA career, your senior year of high school. Um, so what exactly, just looking back on it, what exactly was your favorite part of fighting in the beginning compared to now? Um, you know, I think it was so much easier to see progress back then. You know, my freshman year of high school, I wrestled the heavyweight. I was weighing 230 wrestling guys that weighed 285. Um, and then my senior year, I was wrestling at 170. And then, you know, when I start, started training, I got into it. My coach was like, yeah, you'll probably fight at 155. And to me, somebody that had just weighed 230 a few years ago, I thought that was insane. That makes no sense. But then, you know, the more and more I, I was training and taking things serious, my body was getting leaner, my weight was going down. And and I really was like, OK, I can I can do this. I can get to 155. I can make this a thing. And it was just so much easier being 
less healthy and so much bigger and fatter that like that weight kind of just fell off. It was easy to see the progress. Um, nowadays, it's more of just like reminding myself that I'm making progress. You know what I mean? So like this latest camp, I came out to camp in the best shape I've ever come out in the camp, the lightest ever, um, the strongest ever. And, you know, I was calling my fiance the other night and I was just like, I don't know, like, am I working hard enough? Am I doing enough? And she was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sore. Like I was last time. I'm not as tired as I was last time, but like when I'm leaving training, I'm exhausted. But a couple hours later now I'm sitting around like, all right, what are we doing next? When's the next training session? And I'm like in my head, maybe I'm being lazy. Maybe I'm not working hard enough. And she's like, no, you did all the right things before camp. You dieted down. You did everything to get in shape. You've been doing all your cardio, all your lifts, your weight's good. Your, your mentality's there. Um, and you know, after getting sick, my last weight cut and having to take a few months to just get my body back to norm, you know, having that mindset of like, okay, not only do we have to be low in weight and in shape, we have to be healthy, which means like not eating food that's too acidic for my stomach, things like that. And so like, it's okay to come out of a hard training session and feel good. Like I, I did the right things to feel good. So, you know, just having her there to remind me and reminding myself like, no, this is a good thing. We're making progress. What exactly were you searching for when you first got into MMA? Was it more of an anger outlet? Was it, you were you looking for a discipline? Um, what exactly were you looking for? I mean, currently, obviously you want that UFC contract. You want to be at the top of your game. You want to be UFC champion. And lightweight or, or, you know, the welterweight division. Um, but when you first got into the fight game, what exactly was your goal? Um, I had two goals and I ended up doing one more so during wrestling. And, and the first one was lose weight. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I wasn't just big when I was a freshman in high school, I was big a majority of my childhood. And when I got to be around like, I don't know, 10, 11, you know, I mentally was like, I don't want to look like this. I don't want to be like this. I want to lose weight. And I had tried and started so many times and like quit and failed. And, and I didn't know anything about losing weight. So I was just kind of winging it. You know, I'm, I'm doing the, the quick 30 minute ab workout. I'm doing push ups, whatever I can do. Like, I don't know anything about losing weight. And I failed so many times. So when I discovered the UFC and MMA and, you know, I was still am an anime nerd, like, watching Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that. Like, I was like, oh, like, that's really cool. Like, that's that's like what Goku does. And I was like, all right, well, they have weight classes. Like, maybe I could do that and, like, be a lower weight class. And then, you know, I, I didn't make the basketball team. I got into wrestling, and I was like, I didn't know anything about high school wrestling. I was like, oh, this has weight classes too. Well, what if I just I go down a weight class every year? And that's what I ended up doing. And then when I got into fighting, it was just like – I was just such an angry kid. You know, when I was with my people, I was always smiling and very happy. But internally, I was I was angry at the world. I was angry at a lot of things. And it was one of those things where I could let that anger out and be smiling the whole time. Like my friends could punch me in the face and I'd laugh about it. Like, damn, next time I'm not going to let you hit me. But uh, yeah, it was just like really cool that it was like an anger outlet and me being happy all at the same time. Because you can see that during your walkouts. I mean, you come out to freaking Whitney Houston, my guy, like. <laughs> It's it's pretty awesome to see that you have such a vibrant um, spirit on your way out to the octagon in the octagon once you're outside of the octagon again. Like it's just it's amazing to see that. Um, but on the flip side, I kind of want to go back to the Ultimate Fighter a little bit. I don't want to bug you about it too much, but no, you you're know, good. Yeah, I know you've just I know you've talked about it a lot. You know, it's been a few years, but um, what was the most valuable lesson you learned living in the Ultimate Fighter house? Um, most valuable lesson that I learned there was probably the type of lifestyle that I would need to lead to make this my career. Um, you know, I've lived a very, very unhealthy lifestyle as an amateur and early on as a pro, you know, when I was an amateur and early on as a pro, like me and when I was 19 ish, 20 ish, me and a couple of these kids I used to hang out with, we rented a house together. I don't know how the hell that happened, but we did. We got a house. It was, it's three college age kids. And, you know, we used to throw parties all the time. You're like, oh, it's raining outside. Call people over. Let's have a party. Oh, it's snowing out. You can't go anywhere. Well, whoever can get here, we got booze. Um, like I would be drinking leading up to my amateur fights, like a week before my fight, I'd have take a whole bottle of Patron to the face. And then, you know, my last couple of amateur fights, like I was starving myself to make weight and my early pro days wasn't that bad, but it was on the flip side. It was, I was working overnights, 12 hours a night, training twice a day, drinking six cups of coffee a day, drinking energy drinks, protein bars, whatever I could healthy stuff. Um, 
but the abundance of it was super unhealthy. So now like getting into the tough house where all you do is train, fight and sleep and eat. Like that's where I found my most success. And so, you know, I left that house going, okay, I need to wake up in the morning, make my breakfast and train. Then I need to come home and train, uh, come home and eat, rest, get ready to train again, then come home, eat again. And if I have to go to work, go to work, cut back on the coffee, cut back on the energy drinks, find a time to get a good amount of sleep because that's the biggest part of your recovery. Everybody's always like ice baths and hot tubs and CBD and massage guns. It's sleep. Sleep is the biggest part of recovery. And my early four, five, six pro fights, I didn't have that. I was sleeping three, four, five hours a night and just getting up, going to train and drinking whatever caffeine I needed to, to get to the next training session or work. Um, so now I've been like aiming my life towards that ultimate fighter lifestyle. Like I try to just cut out all the extra BS. Like if it doesn't promote my life or me and my fiance's life to make our lives better, then it's out. I just don't have time for it. And, uh, it's hard. Like there's plenty of times where people are like, Oh, we're going out to the bar. Like you want to come. And I'm like, it's just, you know, I might be fighting soon. I don't know. I got to keep the weight down. I can't right now. But then a couple of weeks later, they'll see me out with somebody else. And they're like, why didn't you come out to the bar with us? I'm like, oh, well, my opponent pulled out. It's his birthday. I haven't seen him in a couple of months. So it's hard, but it, it's stuff that I got to do to get where I need to go. After the Ultimate Fighter, after that finale, what were the discussions like amongst you and your team in regard to where you were going to fight next? Did you automatically know it was going to be um, Cage Titans? Was it um, LFA? I know you fought there. Were you considering those? What was it like? Um, so as soon as I walked out of the cage, I walked into the back of the, you go see the doctor. They're like, what's wrong? I go, I'm fine. hundred percent. No injuries. They're like, you sure? Let me check you out. I was like, no, give me the paper. I'll sign it. I knew I was healthy. I walked into the back locker room. Uh, one of my cornermen was trying to like, give me a hug. And I was like, just give me my jacket. I walked over into the corner. I put the jacket over my head and just started bawling my eyes out. Um, you know, if you, if you rewatch the ultimate fighter finale, I'm actually, and I hate it to this day. And all my friends say that they admire it. I'm actually crying walking out to the cage at the Ultimate Fighter finale because everything that I had gone through in life had led me to this moment. Every time that I was like, it's not going to work out. You're not meant to do this. You're not good enough. You're never going to make it. I told myself that I would get there and I was there. You know what I mean? I was I was the crowd was there. The cameras, Bruce Buffer. I was wearing UFC gloves like this was my time. Um, but I feel like that almost made that too much of like the end goal where that was just kind of like, you know, we're just getting started here. And as soon as I, I was in that corner and I was crying, I knew I dropped the ball. They went and grabbed my fiance. Now my girlfriend at the time, they went and grabbed her and she came over and gave me a hug. And I was like, that's it. I was like, I'm cut. And they were all like, what are you talking about? And I was like, not only was that a poor performance on the biggest ultimate fighter fight card of maybe all time, it was international fight week the day before Stipe and DC. Um, my performances on the show, I had Fox news analysts like comparing me to John Jones and these all time greats. And then I performed like that. I go, I wouldn't keep me. I go, I'm cut. I go, and you know what? It is what it is, but it just sucks. Just let it suck. I'm cut. And everybody's no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And I started getting a little frustrated. I was just like, guys, I'm a huge fan of this sport. I was a fan before a fighter. I know how certain stuff works. I'm getting cut where I'm fighting next. I don't know, but it's not going to be for the UFC. It's just going to suck for a little bit. And then when I'm ready, we'll get right back to it. Um, and I was right. A couple of weeks later, I got the, got the notice that they were letting me go. And uh, I went for a long walk by myself. I told my girl, I literally just got up and I was like, yeah, I'm, uh, I got cut. I got to go for a walk. I'm like, just let me be by myself for a little bit. And I went and went to the spot that I used to go to a lot as a kid. And I just I sat there and cried a little bit more. And I was like, all right, this sucks, but we'll get right back to it. And it took a little longer than I wanted to. Um, but, you know, even, even my girl says that she was like, you were lost for at least a few months. Like I was just kind of moping around and in my head, I was trying so hard not to, but it was just like, felt like the whole world fell down on me. And, you know, I think a little piece of that hung on for a couple of years after the finale, even when I thought I was over it. Um, but you know, finally I'm, I'm over it, you know, and I started doing therapy a few months ago and we worked on it and I'm over it. And your, uh, few first fights after the ultimate fighter, at Cage Titans, you know, people brought it up at the press conferences and, you know, you uh, you were trying to keep that calm demeanor about it, but you can tell that you were still a little upset about it. And then 
uh, you know, eventually you put all of that into the cage and now you're a double champion. So oh, one thing I wanted to ask you, so every athlete that I've seen, not even just UFC, but basketball, baseball, a lot of them don't have a backup plan. You know, a lot of them are strictly, you know, they keep their lives to that sport. But once it's all over, they don't have anything in plan, in motion. Um, what's something that you can see yourself doing once your fight career is over? Uh, when my fight career is over, I'd like to open a gym. And it's one of those things where it's like MMA gyms don't really make much money unless you get investors who already have the money and you get some big stars to come over. Um, but, you know, I just I want to make a poor man's gym full of guys that are striving to be the best, not guys that are just going to, you know, fight around and be local. Those guys are, and girls are welcome to. Uh, but, you know, I want to have a gym where it's not crazy expensive to train at. You know, you get the right work. Nobody's favorite has favoritism. You know, there's room and board if people want to stay there. There's a kitchen, you know, like these big gyms have. And I want to do it and build a, a team chemistry so that, you know, we can almost self-sustain. You know, I don't have to hire people to do certain things. It's like, hey, you're only paying one thirty a month when you can go get the same thing down the street for three hundred dollars a month. How about you help us out a little bit? Cause that just makes everybody's day a little bit better. Um, just all the things that I, you know, would have liked to have coming up in the sport being broke. You know, I got plenty of handouts that I, I didn't want, you know, coaches helping me out, not making me pay and stuff like that, but you know, it hurts them too. And I feel bad about it. And, and I'm sure plenty of other gym owners do it. If a fighter comes in, they got some talents or they're hardworking and they're going through it. So you cut them some slack, you cut the bill or you tell them not to pay for a couple months, but that hurts your pocket. Like I said, MMA gyms don't make a ton of money. So, you know, I want to, I want to make enough money to live a comfy life, take care of my family, but I want my fighters to be taken care of too, and not have to work 40 hours a week to train six hours a week. It's an opportunity to also, you know, maybe corner some fighters and be a, a head coach, essentially. Yeah, for sure. And it, it's funny, I've cornered a few guys and it's honestly more stressful than fighting. And I never thought it would be. Uh, I, I describe it to people. It's like playing a video game and your controller dies and you're just watching your character get the shit beat out of them. And you're like hitting the buttons and nothing happens. But like, you know, that's your job as a coach is to make that connection, you know, plug the controller back in and uh, say it however or whichever way you need to get your fighter to understand and, and do what you think is best. I've always been interested in that. I, I see some fighters in corners and I'm like, when the hell did they start training people? So I've always found that interesting. Um. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with my content, but right now we're going to do something called Visionary's Hot Seat. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Some of them are yes or no. Some of them you can go in depth if you want, but it's meant for you to just answer in any fashion you'd like. Um, okay. The first one is, uh, what was it like working with DC and uh, Cain Velasquez? Intense. Um, you know, DC is a workhorse. He is king of the grind for a reason, and he put us through the ringer. You know, Cain Velasquez is out of here at AKA right now. And he's one of the best coaches I've ever had. Super fun dude. Super nice guy. He's one of the best people I've ever met. But he keeps you in line. He makes sure you're doing shit right. And I respect and appreciate both of them so much. I was screaming free Kane for a while. I didn't know. I didn't remember exactly when he got out. But it's it's great to see that he is home and training people again. What is your dream venue to fight in? CD Garden in Boston. That's the one one but i had to ask some somebody yeah. would have somebody from boston would have said msg or something like that yeah so. everybody wants msg or they want they want vegas but you know i fought in the smaller arena in vegas i fought in plymouth memorial hall i fought in a couple other states but you know i grew up as a kid i went to fenway to watch the Sox. i went to the garden to watch the bruins and the celtics i want kids to go to the garden to watch me fight i want i want to be their celtics i want to be the bruins i want to be the red Sox. what's the best walkout song the best walkout song. I think it depends. I think my fans would say Whitney Houston is their all-time favorite. Um, I don't really know. I, I would probably go with Whitney Houston too because that's the one I've used the most. But uh, honestly, my walkout songs lately, I don't even decide until fight day. Like I just wake up and I'm like, "Yep, that's the vibe." I think it was the Trevor Good fight. You came out to Metallica, was it? Right. Yep. I thought that was that, such a vibe switch and like the way you came out and fought was like, it matched the energy. It was, yeah. I thought that was everybody, dope. everybody was thrown off from that one. They all gave me a round of applause for it, but they were like, I did not see that coming. 
more technical with these questions, more more fight involved. Um, what's your diet like during fight camp versus out of fight camp? Is it similar or do you eat a lot more junk food? Um, it's very similar. So when I'm out of fight camp, I have one cheat day a week and it can depend from either like just going to the movies and having a snack or going to like a, a breakfast joy and get like, I'm a big donut guy. I love, but I like going to like a donut shop, not just like Dunkin' Donuts or some other place. Like I want to go to a mom and pop donut shop. Every donut's made with love and I want some. Um, and then, you know, my regular meals throughout the week are like pretty similar to my fight camp meals, but just larger amounts. And then I just cut back the quantity during fight camp. And then, um, you know, closer to fight fight week, we just cut back on carbs a little bit. That fighter diet, I feel like it makes you uh, live longer. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Toughest opponent so far, to your knowledge, who's been your toughest opponent? My toughest opponent. It's a good one. You mean as if in their tough or like gave me the toughest time? The toughest, the toughest time because there's a lot of fights where you've had to dig it out of the fire. You know what I'm saying? You've had to come back in that very last round. So I would say who's given you the toughest fight in terms of giving you the work? I would say Jose Rivera and I fought him twice as an amateur. And the second time that we fought, he beat the bag out of me on the feet. I was just taking him down and hitting him as hard as I could. And he was so strong. He kept getting up. And like after the third round, I was like, please stop getting up. Just lay here. Uh, and it was funny. I tell people this story all the time because it's like something out of a movie. Uh, I was so concussed from that fight, like during the fight after the fourth round. I'm sitting on my stool to this day. I have no idea what my cornermen are telling me. And there's a voice in my head that was just like, you just walk out there with your hands down. He's only going to hit you like three times. You're going to fall down and then it's over. Then he, then he doesn't have to hit you anymore. And like, I was so tired and concussed and exhausted. I was like, that makes sense. I was like, I'm going to just go out here with my hands down. He's going to hit me. I'm going to wake up in the back room and that's it. He can just stop hitting me. And then this kid that I used to hang out with brought his little brother for the first time to the fights. They were sitting front row. This kid was like 13, had barely spoken to me ever. And he stands up, he starts cussing. You want this more than him. Don't worry about him. You got more heart. He's flipping out. And I'm sitting on the stool looking back like, who is this kid? Like, is this the same kid I've been hanging out with the last two days? And I was like, all right, well, we're not losing in front of him. Like, he hasn't spoken to me in two days, and that's the first words he's going to say. I'm like, all right, well, we're going to go out here and fight. And I went out, and I think I hit him once, maybe. And then I blast doubled him, and I was just on top of him the whole round, just hitting him, controlling him. And I won all five rounds, but I took a beating on the feet. Um, but, yeah, I think that was, like, the, the craziest. Like, I wasn't making the choice to, like, give up, but just a voice in my head was reasoning, like, yeah, just go get hit, and then it's over. And I was like, that makes sense. <laughs> About the fight business. What's the hardest part about the fight business? I would say to keep going when it feels like it's all over, you know? And I think for a lot of people, it can feel like it's all over when you're at the top or when you're at the bottom, because nowadays it's like, for me, everybody, after I win, it's probably one or two days of like, holy shit, that fight was great. Or like, congrats, that was awesome. And then it's like a couple weeks of like, dude, why aren't you in the UFC? Like, what else do you have to do? Like, you're on a three-fight win streak. You're on a four-fight win streak, five-fight win streak. Like, what do you have to do? Like, you've done everything. There's nothing else to do. You should be there. Why aren't you there? And, like, it gets you thinking, maybe they're right. Like, maybe there is nothing else for me to do. It's just not going to happen. And then, you know, there's times like the Ultimate Fighter finale where, like, dude, you ever heard nobody likes you when you're 23? That fight was the day after my 23rd birthday, and I could tell you that Twitter did not like me. I had people messaging me, I, I lost 10 grand because of you, fuck you, da da da. I was like, I lost half of my paycheck too. I wasn't happy about it. Um, but I had people telling me it was over. I'd be poor for the rest of my life. My whole family's going to be poor. It's my fault. Like, wrap it up, retire. At 23 years old, now I'm 28, and I feel like I'm on top of the local scene, and it's, you know, with the opposite attitude people kind of do the same thing where it's like there's nothing left for you to do why aren't you in the ufc and it leaves you with that well what why aren't i in the ufc like what else is there to do um but you just got to keep going
because that's really all there is to do. I mean, I didn't do all this to just get to the top locally and quit. Um, so I'd say the hardest part is whether you're at the top or the bottom is to just keep going. Is it kind of like a thing of people are tired of seeing you win? Like, what, like <laughs> it might what, be. Like, what is it? I think, I think for sure. I think it's, I think some people are tired of seeing me win. I think some people, as much as they want the best for me, like they want to see me tested. I think they want to see me not like they want to see me get punched or take a beating, but they want to see me face some adversity and like come through or like, you know, fight a guy that people know are like, Oh, that's a bad dude. And then if I smoke that guy, it's like, wow, like good for him. And you know, then there's other people that are just like, dude, I want you to be able to, to not be, you know, me, I'm, I'm the poor friend in the group. Any, any friend group that I'm in nowadays, like I'm the poor friend, I'm an MMA fighter. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I got plenty of friends that are just like, I just want you to have a, a life that is equal to how much work you've put in, you know? You know, I don't need, would I like Conor McGregor money? Sure. But like, I got people that are just like, I just want to see you in the UFC because I know you're going to fight whether you are or aren't in the UFC. I'd rather see you fight and put all this work in and make something of it. Um, and like, those are the people that I keep around me. I like, to, I like to hear things like that, especially because of the fact that it's not, it's not really a bittersweet comment. It's more of, we want to see you win, you know? And exactly. similar to them, I do too. I would love to see you win. And speaking on winning, you have an upcoming fight, September 23rd. This is yes, probably sir. the, yeah, this is the meaning of the of the interview right here. This is what people yeah. probably want to hear. So, lightweight title bout against uh, Michael Dufert. Some of your advantages against him. Honestly, I think I think my biggest advantages are my intangibles. You know, I think he has, a lot of people say, like, you need a big ego to be successful. Um and I just, I don't believe it. I've had the ego and it found me great success. And it also found me great failures. And I feel like, I think we're the same age or he's like a couple months older than me or younger than me. I don't know. But he has the ego that I had when I was 22, 21, 23 fighting. Um, like the invincible man ego, which I don't know, I guess you need in this sport. But, you know, he has like a line that he, he carries around that's like, you know, I only count finishes. So I'm 10 and 0. When in reality, he's 11 and 4. To me... I'm 14, four and one. I take all my wins, all my losses, all my draws, take them on the chin, all my failures, all my success, take them on the chin. I sit down, I break it down. Where did I mess up? Where did I succeed? Where did I set myself up for failure or success? And I just accept it because it is what it is. It is fact. It happened. And you know, whether it's a, a marketing platform for him or he truly believes it, he just comes off like he, you know, mentally isn't, I don't know. I hate to say like as matured as me and sound all high and mighty, but yeah, I think he just has that ego that I got rid of years ago. Will be the downfall of the result of this fight. A hundred percent. I think that, uh, I think he's going to be in my face the whole fight, but I think our body language is going to be very different after about a minute into the fight. I think, I'm going to be doing my thing and I think he's going to look pissed off. And a couple minutes after that, he's going to look confused. And a couple minutes after that, he's going to look unconscious. I love to hear it. Um, and that you actually just answered my next question. I was going to ask if you had any predictions for the end of the, for the fight, but you just told me he's going to be unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yep, that was the end of the interview. Um, Joe, I do appreciate you for letting me interview you, giving me the opportunity to um, talk to you during your fight camp week and just being you. Um, anytime, bro, Joe, anytime. But Joe will be defending his title, the Cage Titans uh, lightweight title on September 23rd. Please don't miss it. Tickets are available in the Cage Titans uh, Instagram bio. It was a pleasure. Thank you for chopping it up with me. Yeah, no problem, bro. Anytime. I hope you can make it out to the fights. Uh, if there's any front row, not like I know front row, front row is sold out, but if yeah. there's anything behind it, I will get a ticket. I got you. Just let me know. Anybody that needs tickets, hit me up or any of your favorite fighters on the card. I always say this. I'm not trying to bash Cage Titans, but fighters get a cut and we could use all the money we can get. <laughs> hey,